If you have your Bibles with you this morning, I'd ask you to turn to the book of Exodus, chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3, and we're going to begin reading in the very first verse. Exodus chapter 3, in the first verse, the Bible says, Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the backside of the desert, and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him, in a flame of fire at the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight while the bush is not burned. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. And he said, Draw nigh, high, nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off, from off thy feet. <coughs> Excuse me. For the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for another opportunity to be in your house this morning, Lord. We praise you for that. Lord, we thank you for each and every one that's here this morning. We know they're they're not here by chance, but rather by divine purpose, and you've made it this way. Lord God, we pray this morning that you'd speak to the saved, and it would encourage us as a people, Lord, to know that uh, you're always there, you always have been, and always will be. And Lord, we pray that you might speak to the lost this morning, that you might save them, uh, speak life to them, call them out of darkness, and call them out of death into your wondrous light. And we'd be faithful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it all. For it is in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Now I'll be preaching this morning on the thought, <laughs> finding the perfect will of God. Finding the very perfect will of God. Not the permissive will of God, but the perfect will of God. And I would dare say we spend the bulk majority of our life living in the permissive will of God. Uh, just doing, uh, uh, out, really living outside His will, but not in abject sin. Now, I'm going to point out a few things about Moses. It says, now Moses kept the flock of, his, uh, of Jethro, his father-in-law. Now, uh, it says here that he was the priest of Midian. Now, a lot of people have said, well, he was a, he was a believer. He was not. He was pagan. Now, you watch who you hang with. You watch who you spend the bulk of joy. He, 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 was, he, he, he could not have been a priest because the office of the priest did not even exist at this time. The, the office of the priest, the first priest was Aaron. And so he was not a priest uh, of the Jewish rite. He, he knew nothing about the law because the law did not yet exist. He was pagan. Now, I did a little bit of study on this, and I, what you can depend on, I don't know, uh, that he was of the Druze religion, D-R-U-Z-E. He was not a believer in the great God Jehovah. You know, uh, there was no sacrifice. Now, the sacrifice in the years of captivity, I'm not real sure about. I know there was sacrifice prior to it because Abraham sacrificed before God. Uh, we know that uh, Cain and Abel sacrificed before God. I don't know what they, their state was down in Egypt, but I do know this. They lost a great deal of foothold probably because they didn't serve Him. Uh, probably because they didn't really, until they finally got so bad, then they cried out to God. And you know what? That, I find that among God's people today, things have to get pretty bad before they cry out to God, and that's a double shame on us. That, 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 that's a disgrace to God's people. So when you begin to think of the environment that Moses lived in, he was living among the pagans. We, that, that ought not be to be ever spoken of of God's people. The Bible says you are in the world, but you're not of the world. That means we don't get involved. We don't, get, we don't put down roots. We don't, get, uh, we don't pick up their pagan customs. Amen. And he had. Mm -hmm. He married one. You know what? It's very, it's very much a very careful thing who you marry. Amen. Because once you're, once you're, once you're linked, you're linked. And so 
we find that that's the situation that Moses lived in? I personally think that this is a very good account of Moses' salvation. I don't think he was saved before this. Uh, uh, I don't think that he had been born again in the sense that it was. In verse 2, it says, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. Now, I want you to see that who always initiates the contact between man and God is God and not the other way around. Uh, we've about convinced ourselves that we can approach God. That's never been the case. Uh, he comes to us or you never know it. And so, uh, first it says an angel of the Lord made that burning, burning fiery bush and then God spoke out of it. See, if, if you follow all the way through the Old Testament, the angels very, had a very large role in contact with God's people. Uh, they, 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 were, uh, they, they did almost, you could almost think about what the Holy Ghost does today uh, in initiating the contact. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush, and he looked behold, and, and behold the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight while the bush is not burned. Or burnt. Now, I want you to see what really caught his eye was not spiritual. It was fleshly. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't something that he was looking for God. It was something amazing to see. And you know what? Uh, when you go about from place to place today, that's what people are looking for, something amazing to see. And it really comes in two, two forms. And one of them is the spectacular, how spectacular some so-called church buildings are. Don and I, when we went to Mexico and the boys, and Sarah, I was amazed in the most impoverished area, literally something that looked like a castle in the middle of nowhere, and, and just beautiful and ornate. You know what? That catches man's eyes. And the flip side to that in the modern day is Pentecostalism where uh, everything's about feeling good and plopping on the floor and who can scream the loudest. Mm -hmm. And that gets the flesh too. Sure. And, and so we find that really Moses wasn't seeking God, but rather he was, he was interested in a fleshly way in what can happen. Verse 4 says, And when the Lord saw that he turned to, to see. Now again, now we're switching from an angelic event to, a, to an event with God. The angel had the burning bush. God, he approaches God. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the midst or the middle of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. Now, I want you to see that the effectual call is here. Now, prior to this, Moses was religious, but he did not know God. He, uh, at a, at probably at an age of manhood, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. That was carnal. That was religious. You know, religion will see your soul that never die in hell. Amen. If you don't know Christ, you'll die and go to hell. And it has nothing to do about being a good Baptist. And it has nothing to do about how frequently you attend the house of God. What it, what it has to do with is simply this. Do you know Christ? Amen. And if you don't know Him, you go to hell. And so we see that even though that maybe it was commendable to Him to give up the throne of Egypt, it did not mean that He was saved. And I personally don't think He was to this day when He with an effectual call said, Moses... Moses. And immediately he said, Here I am. Uh, and that is the, uh, the response to a servant. And it gets you in the perfect will of God. Here I am. See, Isaiah to chapter 5 wasn't in the will of God, was it? Chapter 6, if you want to say the end of 5 and the end of 6, when he saw the Lord high and lifted up in the temple. And he said, Here I am, send me, send me. Very same thing with Paul on the road to Damascus. Mm -hmm. yeah. Who art thou, Lord? He knew who he was. <laughs> and so, without the effectual call, then uh, uh, no doubt we're useless to the things of God, and you can't find the perfect.
perfect will of God without hearing from God, without, without being saved. And then when you are saved, having, having a close interaction of prayer, you can't find the perfect will of God. And I, <coughs> I dare say in the modern day, the majority of us live on the border of the perfect will of God and not in the perfect will of God. And the reason why is this, and I've, I've contemplated this, is because it requires work. We live in a lazy day. And, and, and you know what? This generation X, uh, I don't know much about algebra, but I've solved the X. They're just lazy. Yeah. Sure. Right? Don't want to get up and go to work. They don't want to work when they get there. They're just lazy people. And so we, in the modern day, I think why the, 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 we, we're satisfied with living on the periphery is this, is we don't want to dig in. And so we find that Jethro, uh, excuse me, that Moses is spoken to of God. Read verse 6 with me. Moreover, he said, I am the God of my, thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Now, I want you to see the reason I say he wasn't saved previous to this. He introduced himself and said, hey, I'm God. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, if he'd known him, introductions wouldn't have been necessary, would they? Every one of y'all know me, I don't have to introduce myself. Uh, he didn't know God before this occasion. He was religious, but he didn't know God. And, and so, the first thing that you must have if you're going to be in the perfect will of God is know your relationship with God, know your relationship with Christ, and be sure that you've truly been born again. Because without, without the new birth, you have no hope. Without the new birth, uh, you, you, have, uh, you have nothing. Now, I want you to say, I want, and we're going to read one text in a minute, and I, I, I hope to illustrate this to you. Even though he was now saved many, many times, probably the greatest leader of all times, found himself in the permissive will of God. Now, I'll give you a good example. And you know what? The Lord wasn't pleased with that. Uh, Exodus chapter 4. Exodus chapter 4, verse 11. Uh, the Bible says here, and the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth? Now, I want you to see that uh, uh, Moses had been called to lead the people, and he said, I'm not eloquent. Well, you know what? I'm not either. I think my uh, use of the vocabulary in English actually goes down instead of on, on an upswing. You know what? That's okay. Moses used it as an excuse. He said, you lead my children out. You go, you go to Pharaoh and say, let my people go. You know what? When the Lord tells you to say something, the very best thing you can do is say it. Amen. Yeah. Just, just say it. It may not be nice. It may not be pleasant. But say it. Yesterday when I was preaching that funeral, I said, baptism will do you no good. Uh, I said, do you know the person of Christ? I had a room full of people, probably I'll never have the opportunity to say that to again. So I said it. And, and we as the Lord's people, we need to do that. But we'll find that time and time and time and time again, this is the, 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 what men say to God. And the Lord said unto him, who made, the, who made man's mouth? Or who made it the dumb or the deaf? Or the seeing or the blind, have I, have not I the Lord? Now, that will give you a very good understanding of where you're at. If He calls you to it, He'll give you the grace to do it. Now, you know what? Uh, the Bible says here, and we want to boo hoo and blame other things, but He says, when I make a, a, a blind and a deaf and a dumb person, I did it. It, it was an accident. It, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't a thing that just uh, that occurred. God made people that way. Why? I don't understand. But I don't need to understand. I just need to accept it. Amen. And, and, and so we see as the Lord's people, I take from this text that you're not blind, deaf, and dumb. You need to be doing something.
something. You've got, a, you've got something to accomplish and something to do. He says, I'm the one that makes those. Verse 13, and he said, O oh my Lord, send, I pray thee, by the hand of whom thou uh, wilt send. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? I know that he can speak well. And also, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee, and when he seeth thee, he will be glad in his heart. Now, I want you to notice two things. First of all, God don't operate on plan B. Never has, never will. Yeah, that's right. yeah. But Moses found him self in the permissive will of God. Aaron was a rebel. Aaron was not God's man. If you don't believe that, you look at Moses being gone just 40 short days, and Aaron released the whole pile into idolatry. In 40 days, he, he was not a leader in any way whatsoever. <laughs> he was the permissive will of God. Another, another instance that happened, the second time that the, they were grumbling about water, he said, you speak to the rock this time. Because you know what? The rock of the Lord Jesus Christ wasn't smitten but once. He gave His life, it was done. And, and people who say anything the Bible says, you put Him to an open shame. And, and so He says, you speak to the rock. And, and Moses was upset and mad and he slammed the rock again and God honored it. But He did not go into the promised land. You know why? He was in the promises of God. And, and we need to find the ideal place where God has put us and do everything we can as the Lord's people to bloom there. Amen. To do exactly what He'd have us to do, to go and tell people about the Lord Jesus Christ, to continue where you're at. And, and so we as the Lord's people, we certainly need to understand and know that and, and teach and preach what the Lord's given us to do. Now go with me to the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 4. Uh, very familiar verses of Scripture, but I want to read them this morning in your hearing. Uh, Matthew chapter 4 and verse 18. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 18. The Bible says, And Jesus walking by the Sea of Galilee saw two brethren, Simon called Peter, and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And He said unto them, Follow Me, and I will make you fishers of men. And straightway they left their nets and followed Him. Now see, the, the permissive will of God was this, they were fishers. Now, I'll say this, this was their effectual call in one sense. He says, I want you to come with me. Now, I personally don't believe that Peter was saved too much later when he said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Because see, if that's not revealed to you, you're not saved. Right. And, and, and so we, as the Lord's people, He says, You come and follow Me, and I will make you fishers of men. And so they left out, they headed out, they went with Him, they followed Him, all the way up to the day of the crucifixion. And in Pilate's hall, the, they tucked tail and run. In fact, I think the other nine tucked tail and run before that. But we find them there. We find them, we, we find them uh, in it. And as Brother Junior said in his lesson this morning, then Peter says, I go fishing. I'm going back. I'm doing what I did before. I'm going to go get me some money and start earning a living again and getting back in the situation that I was before. That was the permissive will of God. And as Brother Junior pointed out, what did we find him? We find him running around naked again. That was not the will of God. And we know Peter was saved. So we find then that saved people can be out of the will of God. 
And you know what? When, when we get in a condition like that, don't you dare blame God's sovereignty. You know, I get, well, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. You know what that is? That ain't the sovereignty of God. That's a faithless. Amen. That's right. That's all that is. Uh, you know, uh, if you believe that way, probably the primitives will work a little better for you. And, and so we see then, uh, we find time and time again, great servants of God not following the perfect will of God, but uh, uh, choosing to abide in the permissive will of God. And that, that ought not to be uh, among God's people ever. We should crave the perfect will of God. I remember uh, just recently when I gave up my job at the, at the school, and I, I knew what the Lord wanted, and a very well-meaning co-worker said, Larry, don't quit. But I, I knew what the perfect will of God was. You know what? It would have been a lot easier to stay on this flesh. Because I, I didn't know what was out there. I, I didn't know what God had for me. I just knew I had to be in Missouri in preaching the gospel. So I went. Uh, that, that taught me this about the perfect will of God. It's not comfortable in the flesh. It's not. Um, it isn't pleasant to the flesh. It never has been. If you think about it, the... Adam and Eve had all that wonderful fruit to choose from except for two. And they took one of the two and found themselves in the permissive will of God. And if, you, if you'll follow that, what really was the permissive will of God was sin. Because in doing so, all of Adam's race died and was damned to hell in the person of Adam in the permissive will of God. So, where are you this morning? I, I find it very difficult if I get in the permissive will of God to stay in the permissive will of God. Uh, excuse me, in the perfect will of God. If I get in the perfect will of God, it's hard to say there. It's very easy to stay in the permissive will of God because there's no effort involved. And in fact, just say this is the perfect will of God and this is the permissive will of God, it's easy. And then over here, out of the will of God, is even easier. And, and so we see as the Lord's people where we ought to crave to abide is in that perfect will of God where, uh, where, where we should stay at all times. Now, I want to read uh, uh, verse 20 for you. And, straight, and, and they straightway left their nets and followed Him. And going on from thence, He saw other two brethren, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, in a ship with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and He called them. And they immediately left the ship and their father and followed Him. Now, I want you to see in doing that, they had to do two things. They had to be on the move, literally physically coming down out of the ship. Goodbye, Daddy. Now, the problem is today, what I've found, is saying that goodbye, Daddy. Goodbye, normalcy. Goodbye, what I'm used to. Goodbye to the, to the, the comforts of home. You know what? And I enjoy the comforts of home. I praise the Lord, and I've had other opportunities. I praise the Lord that I'm that I am the pastor of this church. My people have been here since this was Tennessee County, North Carolina. I'm pretty used to it. But do I have the desire, the perfect will of God to leave if He called me to leave? Hmm. Right. See, because very quickly, if we're not careful, we can leave the perfect will of God and enter into the permissive will of God because we want the comfort of the flesh. And, and what he was saying is, you leave your father. You, you call, and these two were two of the inner circle. And they left God. Now, have you ever noticed Peter being the third, but Andrew wasn't? Andrew wasn't in the inner circle. And I've often wondered, 
was those other nine, and we know Judas wasn't, the other eight, were they ever in the perfect will of God? I don't know. I'm asking. Uh, because uh, it seems to me, if they had been, that tight inner circle wasn't just their relationship with Christ. Every one of them had a relationship with Christ. I, I would say that it's their closeness to Christ. Amen. Because you remember, uh, John didn't even trust himself. That's right. John laid on his, on his Lord's breast and said, Is it I? Mm -hmm. yeah. He did not even trust himself. You know what? That's the perfect will of God. When you see this flesh for what it really is, and you really don't even trust what it is, you have found the perfect will of God. You might not enjoy it, seeing yourself in that, but then you're useful for the kingdom of God. You're useful for what the Lord has you to do. And so we find four men that's called, giving the effectual call, and yes, I believe probably Andrew was a saved man, but see, what he found was the permissive will of God and never got into the perfect will of God. And you know what? Uh, don't get down on Andrew because I think the majority of today's Christians, and, uh, and I mean true Christians, find themselves there. Now, I want to look in Acts 16. I've read this a lot lately, but the Lord keeps bringing me back to it. Acts 16 and verse 14. Now, if you know where you're at in your Bible, Peter is looking for somewhere to share the Gospel. He'd been down at the temple with no results. And he goes out where some women are talking. Imagine that, right? And uh, just kind of, you know, meeting together and visiting. And he, find, he, he, he finds where they're at and he approaches them, and he just shares the gospel. Now notice what happens in verse 14. And a certain woman... Now, the Lord Jesus always deals in specifics. You know, we're to give a general call and leave that in the hands of a mighty God. And then He'll do the effectual call. He, he will speak life to whom He will. But we're to go to everybody. You know what? When He found Lydia, she didn't have a big E on the forehead saying that she was an elect of God. He shared it with another, a number of women there. And Lydia was the only one that was spoken life to. And that's just how our God works. You know what? Uh, <clears throat> that's not something that we need to even fool with. Have you ever thought about that? Right. Just, just leave it there. Amen. Uh, you know what? Uh, I, I, the Lord been my helper. I'll never try to talk anybody into anything because what will happen is they'll be my disciple and not, and not Christ. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God. Now, I want you to note that the Bible is specific to say that she worshipped God. Lydia was a religious woman. Relig uh, Lydia, and it's the big G God, it wasn't like Moses' father-in-law who was an idolater. It, and she worshipped the God of heaven, the great God of Jehovah, but she worshipped Him without Christ. And I, I'm fearful today that's what many people do. Uh, they think they can go into the throne room without the merit of Christ. You know, people get struck down in the Old Testament for approaching things that way. Uh -huh. if, you, if you don't go by the way of the cross, you won't go. Amen. And so we see then that, that this woman, even though she no doubt was a good woman, and if she was a good Jew, she was very, very attentive to the law, she was religious. But she wasn't saved. And, and, and I, I think we live in a day and age today where many, many people are religious. And I'm talking about Baptist people. I'm, I'm talking about people that we see and know routinely. Well, what they have is a good dose of religion and they've never met the Master. That was, Lydia, that was Lydia's issue, that uh, she was religious and she no doubt enjoyed the Mosaic Law and no doubt she uh, understood things about the great God Jehovah, but she wasn't saved. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God, heard us. 
You know why I go out and preach on the streets? Because that's necessary. Yeah. Now your fatalists won't say that. Your so-called primitive Baptists tell you you can be saved and not even know it. But the Bible tells me that you have to hear the Gospel. And if I don't go around and bear the good news to everybody, I've done them a great, a great disservice. So Paul is doing this. Lydia hears the gospel, and then here's the effectual call, whose heart the Lord opened. You know, that's in the business of God. The business of Paul was to preach the gospel. The business of Satan and Lydia was God's work. And he did it. Whose heart the Lord opened. Uh, what, a, what a glorious day when the Lord opened my heart. Amen. When I began to understand how filthy and vile I really was. I wasn't Jim's good boy. James was a bad boy. I was a good boy. <laughs> or at least that's what everybody told me. But in reality, I was vile. In reality, I needed the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Desperately, I needed Him. And, and so we see uh, as the Lord's people that this is what salvation is. Is about for the and I don't know how long she remained here, but you know you know why there's such joy when the Lord first saves you. You're in the perfect will of God. Right. You've not drifted out. You 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 you've not found other enticements. You've not you've not let yourself uh, move from His will. But at that moment when the joy overwhelms you, you are in the perfect will of God. That's why Peter said, uh, "Who art thou, Lord?" Huh. That's why. That's why he said, "Lord, what would Thou ask me to do?" Right. For that moment, he was in the perfect will of God, and I would say that Paul spent a great deal of time there, and ought to be our example. Uh, this is how she was in the perfect will of God. This is an illustration. This is a sh what shows she was. Uh, at the end of verse fourteen, whose heart the Lord opened. And she attended unto the things which were spoken of, of Paul, which were spoken of Paul. Now, um, see, when you're in the perfect will of God, baptism's not an issue for you. You'd be glad. That's right. Yeah. When you're in the perfect will of God, attending the house of God's not an issue for you. Uh, you don't need a church bus, right? Right. You get there if you have to walk. And, and, and that's the perfect will of God. When you're in the perfect will of God, you don't cringe at the preaching of tithing because you know it's the perfect will of God. That makes sense? And, and, and so for when, she, when Paul was telling her different things concerning what needed to be done, she was glad to go do them. Verse 15. And, and when she was baptized... And her household, she besought us. Now, a lot of yeah, Presbyterian folks want to throw see the babies. The babies were baptized. Well, nowhere in there does it ever say Lydia had a baby, does it? I'm sure Paul went down to her house, just like he did the Philippian jailer, just a couple of verses down, and preached unto them Christ. Right. right. And the Lord saved them too. Amen. And so, uh, but baptism, uh, and you know, uh, uh, this may, this is not popular preaching, but you know, every time there's a conversion in the Bible, there's a quick baptism. Hmm. You know, this stuff of waiting and looking and, and, and getting your checklist out, there ain't a word of truth in it. Hmm. Uh, are there some people out there deceived? Sure. Is that our business? No. Amen. That's right. Not our business. And, and so we see as the Lord's people that, that this type of person of Lydia is who we ought to desire to be. So they were baptized. And notice what the, uh, the work in her life. She be, saw this saying, if you judge me to be faithful to the Lord, that's the perfect will of God is being faithful to the Lord, Come into my house and abide here, and she constrained us. Now, did you get it? Uh, she was in the will of God, and the result of being in the will of God, she was concerned about the Lord's meaning. 
Remember what it said concerning uh, women in the church to be taken under the care of the church if she's washed the saints' feet? See, that that's being in the perfect will of God. You know what? You had to be pretty humble to wash someone else's feet. Right. But I'll say this, what I have found, and maybe it's because I'm a nurse, I don't have an issue washing people's feet. I really don't. Uh, I've done it so many times, I, I don't have an issue with it. But, it made me very uncomfortable for someone to wash mine. Does that make sense? And, and so we see that Lydia found the will of the Lord and she stayed in the will of the Lord and she wanted to do the Lord the, her, any kind of service that she might could do, <laughs> including to bring them into her own house. Now drop down to verse 40. Now this is after their little encounter with the Philippian jailer. And notice what it says in verse 40. And they went out of the prison. The Philippian jailer had been converted. The chains had fell off. The Philippian jailer had turned them loose. And they entered into the house of Lydia. Now, why, why is that significant? Well, you want a convict staying in your house? That's what was happening. See, Lydia loved the Lord. And while it may have seemed stupid to other people, and even putting her own uh, self at risk, and, and I, I've often heard it said that Lydia was probably a wealthy woman because she was a seller of purple. And that was a, that was a special kind of cloth mostly used for the head covering of, uh, of, of Jewish men. Very lucrative business. You know what? She's willing to give it all up to find the perfect will of God. And we ought to be too, you know. Whatever's necessary, whatever is the hindrance, whatever's the difficulty, we need to find the perfect will of God. Acts 18, just a little further over, uh, verse 1. Acts 18, verse 1. And after these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontius, lately come from Italy, with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome, and came unto them, and because he was of the same craft, he abode with them, and wrought, and wrought for by their occupation they were tent makers. Now, Paul uh, had no idea what was going to grow out of this relationship. He needed a job. Um, you know what? It's a wonderful thing when a church financially can take care of the pastor. But as time goes on, I've seen that less and less of a possibility. And, and it's not because those saints don't depend on the Lord. There's just less of us. People can say what they want. The churches are getting smaller. And for an individual who's had the opportunity to travel, it's not just over Tennessee. It's all over. I told you a couple weeks ago, I know of three churches that are meeting in houses because they can't afford to maintain a building. And, and, and so we see as the Lord's people that I ain't the only preacher that's ever worked. Paul wasn't the only preacher that ever worked. And certainly I won't be the last. And so he used the opportunity instead of getting the mother grubs, oh, I wish I was full time like John. Uh, instead of getting the mother grubs, he took the opportunity to witness to the people he was working with. You know, that, that, that's a whole lot. That's a full-time job if you just witness to the people you're working with. That, 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 that's a mission effort in of itself. Drop down to verse 18. And, and Paul, after this tarried there yet a good while, then took his leave of the brethren and sailed unto Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila having shorn his head in Centuria, for he had a vow. Now, I want you to see something in here. Paul, I mean, excuse me, Aquila and Priscilla had been converted. The Lord had saved their soul. And they wanted to stay with Paul. Uh, what they were was in missionary training. They didn't know it at the time, but that's what, that's what the Lord was doing in their life. And they, they later on would break off and, and, and do their own thing. 
to find the perfect will of God. See, I don't think Priscilla and Aquila wanted to move around. Remember, they had been, they'd been evicted from the nation of Rome because they were Jew. And you know what? I bet when they arrived at Corinth, they would say, oh man, I hope this is home. I hope this is where we'll remain. I hope we get to put down some roots, raise some little ones down in Corinth. But that just wasn't God's will. Right? Yeah. We think we know God's will sometimes when we don't. Amen. You know, uh, I really believe, and it's troubled me for some time, and I met a few younger preachers more recently. But for a long time, in my early 40s, I was still a young preacher. That's scary. And I don't believe everybody's like, well, it's the last day and we won't need that next generation of preacher. Well, you know what? You don't know when the Lord's going to come back. That's right. First of all, That's right. nobody does. Yeah. Secondly, I think it's a lot of boys, young men, living in the permissive will of God. It's not that He's not calling they're not saying yes. Right? And, and so we see uh, in the modern age how that can impact. But we find Priscilla and Aquila leaving what they had. And the English here to me is kind of different. But I'm assuming since the, the last person mis- mentioned was Aquila, that the helping verbs, his... And he, that's after that, then Aquila had shaved his hair. That was a vow saying, I'm going to do whatever. In this case, I think he was saying, I am going to serve God. I'm going to follow Paul. I'm going to learn how to be a missionary. And, and so we see that that was his desire. And he came to Ephesus and left them there. And so I'm assuming Paul and pretty and Paul got to Ephesus, dropped off Priscilla and Aquila, and you know what? Flip over a couple of uh, pages in your Bible, and you'll find a letter to the church at Ephesus. And you know why? Because he dropped off Priscilla and Aquila, and they did their job. See, finding the perfect will of God is all important to a believer. You can't abide in the permissive will of God and, and lay a crown to the feet of Jesus. The Bible has a great deal to say about crowns, does it not? And uh, when the, the four and twenty elders are casting their crowns before the person of the Lord God Almighty, do you think they're the only ones that has that opportunity when we're told very clearly there's a crown of life? There's a crown for ministry? But there's four distinct crowns in the New Testament. And you, you ought to study them, and you, what you really ought to do is desire them. To have something to lay at the feet of Jesus. And, and, and so we see then, uh, as the Lord's people, what we need to do is find the perfect will of God. And the perfect will of God is often. Um, Often moving. I want to show you it's dynamic. It's changing. It's not always the same place. Drop down. Uh, drop down to verse uh, 26 of this cha- same chapter. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. Whom, when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him. They took him unto him and expounded him the way of God more perfectly. So we know Priscilla and Aquila were there listening to the preaching that was down at the temple. And here's this young man that kind of preached along the order of John the Baptist. And you know what? They didn't rebuke him. They didn't say, hey, shut up a minute. I'm going to tell you something. But they took him aside and said, Christ has come. The one John talked about has come. He's given himself, he's died a vicarious death down, down in Jerusalem. And you know what? It corrected the problem there. See, that, that, that is being placed in the right place at the right time. If they had not left with Paul, if they'd say, hey, we're going to stay at Cor- Corinth and put down some roots, he would have used someone else to do this. Would it have been accomplished? Sure. But see, Priscilla and Quilla wouldn't have had, wouldn't have had, wouldn't have had a crown attached to that. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter number uh, 16. Uh, 1 Corinthians 16, uh, verse 3. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 3. And when I come, 
Whomsoever enter ye shall prove by your letters, then will I send to bring uh, your liberality unto Jerusalem. That's not the verse I wanted, but I, the I'm sorry, uh, verse 19. Drop down to verse 19. The churches of Asia salute you. Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord. Now, he's writing to Corinth and he mentions Priscilla and Aquila. Now, I don't know where they're at, but they're still about the Father's business. And I personally think that they've moved around some because he was still in close contact with them. Um, they may have been at Ephesus, but see, he was having to write down to Ephesus too. And he says here, they greet you. You know, uh, uh, when, I, when I was leaving to go over to Missouri, uh, uh, I think it was Donna said, you tell, you, you tell Miss Mary, I said, hi. Now, it had been difficult for Donna to write to me and say when you get, you know, it, it would have been a lot, a, lot, a lot of extra stuff and we don't even see that in the church letters, right? And, and, and so, I'm assuming this couple was still on the move, still doing God's work, still missionizing where the Lord planted them, finding the perfect will of God. Last place I want to let, read, 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Uh, verse 19. 2 Timothy chapter 4 uh, and verse 19. The Bible says, Salute Priscilla and Aquila and the household of Onephesus. So now we find him that Timothy is the preacher at Ephesus. And we find him back at Ephesus. See, the perfect will of God is dynamic and moving. Now that don't mean you're going to run church to church to church. The Lord may have that for you. But what it what it does mean is where you're at, you serve him for you. Amen. Where you're at, you do all you can. Because see, there there you know, I, I don't know where the Lord's churches have got off to this stagnant. Uh, time, you know, a pond that's stagnant has no fresh water. It stinks and it smells and it's still. Uh, they don't have to be God's people. We need to move. We need to be dynamic. We need to find the will of the Lord and just stay in it. 